Good evening. Bonsoir. Welcome. Bienvenue. My name is Dr. Ann Collins, and I will be your facilitator for this evening. I served as president of the CMA in 2020 to 2021. It was a wonderful opportunity to serve the Physicians of Canada to advocate on those issues that were of critical importance at that time, uh, certainly during the thickest part, perhaps, of the pandemic. And many of those issues, of course, continue on today. So we look forward to hearing from the candidates this evening um, about how they will work through that type of uh, scenario as well. I also had the uh, distinct, uh, I guess, the distinct uh, pleasure of being the only fully virtual ever president of the CMA, and I hope that I am the only one that ever um, has that uh, experience, but it was great nevertheless. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which I'm joining you from this evening in Fredericton, New Brunswick, is the unceded territory of the Wolustique or Maliseet peoples. Since we are participating in this virtual meeting from different parts of the country, I would like to acknowledge that we are on many treaty lands and unceded territories. I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. While most of the questions tonight will be asked in English, candidates can choose to answer in the language of their choice. For this reason, the simultaneous interpretation is available by clicking on the interpretation button located in the meeting control panel at the bottom of your screen. Select the language you would like to hear, EN for English or FR for French. If you do not select an option, you will hear comments in the language spoken. As a reminder to everyone joining us, this session is being recorded. Every year, the president of the CMA is elected by members from a different province or territory based on an alphabetical rotation. In 2023, it's Manitoba's turn to elect the president for 2024, 2025. Any CMA member with a Manitoba postal code is eligible to vote for the CMA president-elect between February 22nd and March 8th. The re results of the election will, will be announced shortly after on cma.ca. For tonight's session, we have opened the attendance to all CMA members across the country. This session is an opportunity for members to hear candidates talk about their plan to be the national voice for physicians and support the CMA's work, their priorities for health system change and key issues affecting the profession. Candidates will begin by introducing themselves. They will then answer a few questions that reflect the priority issues facing the profession and the health system. Then we will open it up for them to also answer member questions. We've opened the Q&A button. At any time, please type in your question and click on Submit. We will vary the order in which candidates will answer the questions while giving each candidate the opportunity to answer the question. Each candidate will have the same amount of time to answer. Let's meet our candidates. Each will have two minutes to tell us about themselves. We'll proceed in alphabetical order. Let me welcome our first candidate, Dr. Corey Bailey. Dr. Bailey, you have two minutes to tell us about yourself. Thank you, Dr. Collins. My name is Corey Bailey. I'm a rheumatologist practicing in Winnipeg. I'm a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan, where I also completed my internal medicine and rheumatology residencies. I moved to Winnipeg in 2001 and have been in clinical practice with an appointment as an assistant professor with the University of Manitoba. I've been committed throughout my career to medical association leadership. I've had the privilege of serving as a board director, board chair, and president of both my National Specialty Society, the Canadian Rheumatology Association, and my Provincial Medical Association, Doctors Manitoba. 
I also have an interest in medical education and have served as a rheumatology residency program director at the University of Manitoba and currently serve as competency committee chair. I believe that there's never been a more important time for the CMA. Like no time in the past, the Canadian public and governments are focused on physicians and their role in our struggling healthcare system. CMA advocacy has highlighted the need for system change. A national human resource strategy, physician health and wellness, the crisis in primary care, pan-Canadian licensure, improving team-based care, a national medical record, and long-term care reform are all issues that would have the potential to be addressed during my term. If elected, I'm confident that I can leverage my provincial and national level medical leadership, governance, and advocacy experience to work towards the CMA vision of a vibrant profession and a healthy population. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. It's now time for us to meet our second candidate, Dr. Anthony Batad. Dr. Batad, the floor is yours. Please tell us about yourself. Thank you very much, Dr. Collins. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony uh, Batad. Um, I am a Manitoban through and through, having grown up in Gilbert Plains, Manitoba, just outside of Dauphin. My family, for some unknown reason, having settled there ever after immigrating in the Philippines in 1975. I graduated from the University of Manitoba Faculty of Medicine in 1999, uh, finishing my residency from the same institution in general internal medicine in 2003. After medical training, I went back to the military for a return of service. I spent just under 24 years in the military, retiring in 2012 after I achieved the rank of Lieutenant Colonel, moving through the ranks through my whole career. I've been involved in military operations all over the world, as well as uh, within Canada. In my civilian life, I have spent all my time as a clinician educator. I have uh, held the roles of medical director for the Master of Physician Assistant Studies, as well as being the program director for the General Internal Medicine Residency Program here at the University of Manitoba. I am currently the clinical skills course director um, for the Med 1s and 2s at the University of Manitoba. I am also involved in the International Medical Graduate Training Program. I put my name in for the CMA president-elect because I'm at a point in my career where I feel that I have the experience and perspective to lead the profession through what is anticipated to be a rapidly changing and challenging time. I think I have an extensive network of colleagues, both locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, and I am acutely aware that until recently, when I took over the medical specialty lead for the WHA, but I've had no formal senior administrative experience within the current system. But I don't necessarily see this as a disadvantage, but as an opportunity to approach this leadership through a different lens. I'm passionate about building a diverse, resilient and sustainable healthcare system. And if elected, I intend to be a very strong voice for change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Batad. Our third candidate is Dr. José Francois. Dr. Francois? Please introduce yourself. Good evening, bonsoir. Uh, I'm José Francois. I'm uh, a family physician in uh, Winnipeg. I grew up in southeast Manitoba in the community of uh, St. Anne. Uh, did medical school at the University of Sherbrooke, uh, returned for residency uh, here in Manitoba, and uh, added on a master's in medical education uh, a little later on. Um, I, I practice comprehensive uh, family medicine uh, with outpatient, uh, inpatient work at Victoria Hospital and some long-term care at uh, Action Marguerite. Um, and I've been engaged in medical leadership for about 20 years. Uh, I've had a number of roles, uh, both uh, local as site director for residency programs to uh, the deanery at uh, the University of Manitoba for continuing professional development. Last nine years, I've been um, head of family medicine at the University of Manitoba and uh, more recently the inaugural uh, specialty lead for family medicine uh, at Shared Health. Um, the last few years have definitely been uh, challenging to be in uh, health system leadership uh, with COVID. I had a front row seat uh, on many of uh, the challenges that uh, physicians experienced. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to help people out 
uh, physicians and outpatient practices by providing guidance, uh, helping uh, craft uh, uh, new tariffs for virtual care, um, assisting in the rollout of vaccination campaigns and practices and testing uh, sites in, in family physician practices. So that's all given me a sort of good perspective of what changes our health system need. Uh, and I hope as I complete my term as a department head and enter the next chapter of, of my career that I can use those knowledge and skills to advance uh, our physician practice. Thank you, Dr. Francois. The final candidate is Dr. Joss Reimer. Welcome, Dr. Reimer. Please tell us about yourself. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Bonsoir. Merci à toutes et à tous de nous joindre ce soir. C'est un honneur de parler avec vous. Je m'appelle Dr. Jocelyn Nicole Reimer, ou en anglais, my name is Dr. Joss Reimer, and I am a public health physician. Um, I'm currently working as the Chief Medical Officer for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority, and I also work clinically at Women's Hospital as a staff family physician where I provide care in triage or on the wards or delivering babies or assisting in surgery or whatever else uh, needs care when I'm there. I grew up in southern Manitoba in a rural community uh, where my dad uh, was a family physician and still practices rural family medicine in that community. Uh, I have lived in multiple countries and different parts of Canada as well, including Switzerland and Ecuador and Costa Rica, but have spent the majority of my life in Manitoba uh, and came to Manitoba as well for medical school. After medical school, I went to Ontario where I started an obstetrics and gynecology residency uh, and unfortunately experienced a fair bit of burnout during my residency there that led to me changing programs to public health. And while that was a very difficult time for me, I'm so thankful for what I've gone through because it led to a career in public health that I love. Um, and in my career in public health, I've had many opportunities to take part in really exciting interventions to help improve the health of Manitobans, of Canadians, and of everyone in our community. That includes being the medical director of public health uh, for the city of Winnipeg, uh, including during the pandemic. I also was the um, medical director of undergraduate medical education for community health sciences uh, for about a decade at the University of Manitoba, where I helped to uh, by designing and running the four-year population health course that is still used today for all of the medical students who study at the University of Manitoba. I continue to teach in population health as well. And then most recently, uh, I was the spokesperson and the medical lead for Manitoba's Vaccine Implementation Task Force, where you saw me navigating many challenging uh, political and public communication Excuse environments. Excuse me, Dr. Dr. Reimer, I'm just going to ask you to wrap up the... Sure. You've, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm just thankful to have the opportunity to speak to everyone today. Great. Thank you very much, everyone, for telling us about yourselves. Uh, and for joining us, taking the time to join us the, this evening at this very busy time. The next hour will be a Q&A period with our candidates. We'll start with questions that we shared in advance with the candidates. For the latter half of the Q&A, we'll ask the audience to type their questions using the Q&A feature. We will also include questions, um, sorry, you can upvote questions you'd like to see answered. We ask everyone to support a respectful, professional, and collaborative discussion. Questions that are discriminatory, defamatory, abusive, or offensive, or that violate privacy or confidentiality will not be addressed. As an exceptional measure, any participant who repeatedly submits inappropriate questions may be removed from the meeting. Now, please allow me to ask the first question. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer. Question one. Describe how your vision for health, the health system, and the health workforce in Canada aligns with CMA's strategy. 
First to answer this question will be Dr. José Francois. Dr. Francois. Thank you. Um, my, my vision is uh, to ensure that physicians are well supported so they can optimally care for, for patients. Um, the, our experience through COVID has really identified where we have gaps in our system. Um, it has created a system that is broken, um, where we have providers that are stressed. Um, and it's also shown that we have a very significant variability in the outcomes of, of for Canadians. Um, in the key areas that I think um, would be my focus uh, are really around um, building up our human resources, uh, our training capacity, both for Canadians and INGs, uh, really looking at um, pushing transformation of care models, moving to more team-based care models, um, and ensuring that physicians are adequately supported in terms of remuneration models uh, to work in those new environments. Uh, I think uh, we also need to make sure that we're um, attentive to the health and wellness uh, of, of our providers, of our physicians, um, and building up the resources uh, to support them. Uh, and, and, and finally, I think, you know, these all align with uh, many of the things that are identified as strategic orientations of the CMA, so they nest themselves quite well. I think any, any leader coming into this role um, needs to be mindful that uh, they are there to advance the organization's uh, orientations and uh, that strategic plan. Um, and certainly that would be uh, my goal along with uh, the CMA board. Thank you, Dr. Francois. Dr. Bailey, describe how your vision for health, the health system and the health workforce in Canada aligns with CMA strategy. Thank you, Dr. Collins. My vision certainly does align with the CMA Impact 2040 strategy. Health doesn't just mean the absence of disease, but rather well-being physically, mentally, and socially. I know that so many societal factors can influence one's individual health, and I applaud the CMA approach of advocacy to help reduce poverty because we know that wealth is health. Advocacy on the importance of mental health and ensuring that there's increased resources to help optimize Canadians' mental health and continued adv advocacy on risks to our traditional physical health. To achieve this though, Canadians need a health system which is patient-centric, not on payers or on maintaining the status quo. As a recent public policy forum, Taking Back Healthcare so eloquently stated, why can Canadians move anywhere in the country and count on a public school to be available in walking distance to teach their children? And yet our healthcare system has 5 million Canadians without a family physician. Why, when I as a rheumatologist refer a patient for surgery, do they have no idea how many months they still have to wait for consultation? And then how many months or years that they'll wait for the surgery? Why do we have no firm grasp of the physician workforce and what the needs are for the Canadian population in coming years? Finally, we need a healthcare workforce with physicians and other healthcare workers who are valued and respected, who are supported in their own health and wellness, who are remunerated fairly, and in which equity, diversity, and inclusion for healthcare workers and their patients thrives. Making all of these reforms won't be easy. There's no simple fix for a generation, but with determination and appropriate resources, the CMA can lead the way. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Reimer, describe how your vision for health, the health system, and the health workforce in Canada aligns with CMA's strategy. Thank you for the question. My vision is for all physicians in Canada to have the resources, the support, the respect, and the autonomy that they need to thrive in their medical practice and find joy in their work. We need to be looking at what I'm hearing from physicians all the time as I'm talking to them as chief medical officer, and that's their experience of burnout. We need to be looking at things like reducing the administrative burden that physicians are facing. We know they're spending 10 and a half hours a week on paperwork. We need to be looking at interprofessional teams and ways that we can promote more support in our ability to care for patients so that physicians can focus on what they're really good at and what they're really passionate about, and that is caring directly for those patients. We need to look at national licensure. 
I'd like to start potentially with looking at resident licensure as a way that we could explore the ability to expand beyond the provincial approach in a way that will benefit residents who want to do out of province electives, um, but still help us build towards a national licensure overall. And as a public health physician, I'm very passionate about health equity and about inclusion and diversity and bringing diverse voices to leadership tables and to become part of the team. Finally, I want the CMA to be a trusted scientific voice for Canadians. During the pandemic, it was clear that misinformation is causing harm like we've never seen before. I want to help be that voice for Canadians, someone they can look to when they need information about complex topics. And I want to help train all physicians to be communicators and leaders in science communication. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Dr. Batad, describe how your vision for health, the health system and the health workforce in Canada aligns with CMA strategy. Thank you, Dr. Collins. My vision for health, much like Dr. Corey Bailey's, is one that is not merely the absence of disease. It is of a healthy population that enjoys food security, secure housing, educational economic opportunities and safe communities. My vision for health would be to promote preventive strategies, including addressing social determinants in Manitoba, specifically being food security um, in remote communities. I want to encourage the development of a multidisciplinary community and team-based system, especially in addressing elder care and the care of those with complex chronic medical conditions that I unfortunately see um, in my practice as a, as a hospitalist. My vision for the health system is for a responsive and agile organization, recognizing that there are unique health challenges coming our way and anticipating these evolving challenges. It has to be well-resourced, but sustainable with concrete evidence-based metrics that we can look back to and adjust as we need. My vision for the health workforce involves a foundational approach. I want to engage the Canadian Federation of Medical Students, the provincial and territorial medical student and resident associations. I want to encourage membership uh, and engagement from the trainees with the CMA and with physicians early on in their training. I want to educate trainees on the CMA Impact 2040, a bold and exciting um, strategic roadmap into a system that they'll be coming into. I want to strengthen the engagement with the CMA and the medical trainees who are the future of our profession. For the existing workforce, I want to promote a team-based primary care um, system to policymakers with funding support for wellness and practice uh, resources. I want to continue with the message set out in Impact 2040 as well as the CMA focused priorities and so that we can have a resilient uh, workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Batad. For our next two questions, we thought we'd add local flavor. We've been working with Doctors Manitoba to promote this session and enable members to learn more about the candidates for president-elect. I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Boroditsky, Doctors Manitoba president-elect, to come to the mic. Please proceed, Dr. Boroditsky. Thank you uh, for having me join. Uh, healthcare is in a crisis across Canada and we have a shortage of doctors. Physicians are drowning in paperwork and are undervalued by the health system they work in. They have lost control and independence over their work. It's no wonder distress and burnout in our profession are at an all time high. What would you do as president to support physician wellness, recognizing that so much of the causes are institutional and systemic in nature? Thank you very much, Dr. Boroditsky. Similar to the previous question, candidates, you each have two minutes to answer the question. And we'll begin with Dr. Anthony Batad. Healthcare is in crisis. I'm going to ask the question each time just so that it's uh, uh, fresh in everybody's mind. Healthcare is in crisis across Canada and we have a shortage of doctors. Physicians are drowning in paperwork and are undervalued by the health systems they work in, and they have lost control and independence over their work. It's no wonder distress and burnout in our profession are at an all-time high. What would you do as president of the CMA to support physician wellness, recognizing that so much of the cause 
so many of the causes are institutional and systemic in nature. Dr. Batad. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Threats to physician wellness are many. Administrative burden, including pressures from senior administration, the sheer volume of patients that we're being expected to see, the acuity and complexity of illness, and of course, public expectation on what we are supposed to do as physicians. Supporting physician wellness must address all of these threats, and it is a difficult juggling act. The goal should be in reducing the number of physicians needing services such as wellness uh, initiatives, but I know that's impossible, and so these initiatives are also important. We must in, uh, address um, educational, employment, and peer support in the, in the uh, physician's day-to-day -day, uh, performance uh, of their duties. Physicians must feel valued by the system. This goes a long way to producing wellness during the pandemic we continued to provide service and we felt undervalued at times and that led to burnout. Much of the current challenges are institutional and systemic as the question states, but institutions and systems are not inanimate. They're made up of people who I optimistically feel have the common goal of providing better patient care to everyone. Because systems and institutions are made up of people, there's an opportunity with good communication to break down a lot of the differences in ideology and political leanings and proceed as a unified force moving forward. I wanna encourage medical learners to adopt a healthful approach to their training. I wanna educate them on the early signs of burnout. I see this every day as I teach everybody from Med 1 uh, to R5. I want to address the elephant in the room that is potentially the toxic medical culture. And I want to work towards a diverse and a resilient workforce. And that must start from the very beginning and the foundation. A diverse physician workforce provides a powerful support mechanism that will go a long way towards addressing uh, physician wellness. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patad. Next, Dr. Reimer. What would you do as president to support physician wellness, recognizing that so much or so many of the causes are institutional and systemic in nature? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. As a public health physician, you know, I've been trained to look at issues with an institutional or systemic lens. And I agree that this is absolutely a system level issue that's become a public health crisis. And so I'm very passionate about working on the issues to help support physicians. We need to be advocating for a lot of different things to support physicians to do their jobs and to do it in a way that keeps them healthy and thriving. So that means we need to be advocating for more interprofessional teams, whether that's physician assistants, whether that's dietitians, OT, PT, the whole team working together to provide care to a patient. We need to be looking at the administrative burdens. We've seen the report that we have 18.5 million hours spent on unnecessary paperwork in Canada. If we can reduce that even a small amount, we can do so much more to care for our patients and to keep each other healthy. We, of course, need to be working hard to provide supports to people already experiencing burnout. As someone who's been through it, I'm really passionate about making sure that those going through it do have access to the care that they need. But even more than that, I'm passionate about not having people go through what I went through. And so I want to advocate on behalf of physicians to change the systems so that they feel supported, so that they have access to the resources that they need, whether that's electronic solutions, whether that's expanding our training programs, and whether that's looking at how we can expand diversity in the workforce. We need to be looking at diversity, not just at getting into medical school, but how do we keep diverse individuals involved as we move through the leadership structures? Because when we have those diverse voices in leadership, it's better for all of us to get that expertise and for people to see themselves reflected in leadership and how decisions are made. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Dr. Bailey, what would you do as president of the CMA to support physician wellness recognizing that so many of the causes are institutional and systemic in nature. Thank you for the question, Dr. Borditsky and Dr. Collins. We know from the Physician Health Survey that the mental health of Canadian physicians is languishing and that one in two are suffering from burnout. Over a third have had suicidal ideation at some point. Clearly, these are chilling numbers. When one considers the issue of physician wellness and how CMA can address it, I feel it's important to remember that there are three contributors to burnout. 
individual factors, work factors, and organizational factors. As president, I'd advocate that we need to pay attention to all three. Individually, although the culture is thankfully changing, as a profession, we as physicians aren't good at tending to our own wellness needs. The culture begins in medical school and heightens during residency. We often rely on denial and avoidance as coping strategies. We don't want to burden our colleagues. We're afraid of repercussions from regulators. Work factors are numerous. Inefficient work processes and environments, EMRs and health records with poor user experience, endless forms, tasks that don't have physicians working at the top of their licenses, and organizational factors, a lack of control and flexibility in our work environments, poor behaviors by system leaders and government, a never-ending workload and demands placed on physicians. Thankfully, there's strong evidence that both individual and system-based approaches can meaningfully reduce physician burnout. CMA needs to continue to work together with their PTMA colleagues to provide individual resources and help change the culture around wellness while advocating for the system-wide changes needed to address the root causes. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Francois, what would you do as president to support physician wellness, recognizing that so many of the causes are institutional and systemic in nature? As was discussed, the drivers uh, for burnout are, are multiple, excessive workload, um, work inefficiency, loss of flexibility of scheduling, work-life interactions, uh, loss of meaning of work. Um, so dealing with these requires uh, interventions at the physician level, but also at the institution or system level. And I think at the physician level, a lot of the uh, initiatives that have been promoted by our provincial territorial um, groups uh, and the CMA nationally have looked at helping physicians identify their risk for, for burnout, uh, looking at prevention strategies, looking at supports, whether that's mentorship uh, or professional supports uh, to help those uh, who are dealing with burnout. Those things we need to continue until we've had the ability to resolve those systemic issues, um, we need to still maintain and focus at that individual level. On the health system side, uh, I think many of the issues um, require physicians to be engaged in finding solutions. Uh, we need to engage our physicians, whether that's at the hospital level, the clinic level, the regional health level, uh, at looking at the multitude of issues uh, that uh, cause problems uh, in people's work days. Uh, those can be simple things of the way work is organized, uh, whether the EMR is working or not, uh, but it uh, also involves larger discussions to look at administrative load. Um, and when we look a few jurisdictions, our own in Manitoba uh, has set up a task force to deal with some of those issues. I think all jurisdictions need to do similar work, uh, looking at uh, how we carve away not all of it, but a good portion or a portion of that administrative load so that physicians can do what they do best, which is care for patients. Thank you, Dr. Francois. Thank you all. And thank you again, uh, Dr. Boroditsky, for taking the time to be part of this webinar this evening, for the question from Drs. Manitoba, and indeed for your leadership. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Joanne Lynch, Manitoba College of Family Physicians President, to ask the next question. Please, Dr. Lynch, proceed. Thank you very much, Dr. Collins. In your role as an elected leader of the CMA, what changes would you advocate for to ensure that family doctors are adequately resourced and respected for their work? Thank you for that question, Dr. Lynch, and we'll begin with, and again, uh, candidates, each of you will have two minutes to answer, and we'll begin with uh, Dr. Reimer. Uh, Dr. Reimer, what changes would you advocate for to ensure that family doctors are adequately resourced and respected for their work? 
Thank you so much, Dr. Lynch, for that question. Um, as I said, I, I grew up in rural Manitoba where my dad continues to be a rural family doctor. And I've worked in primary care in fee-for-service as well as in alt-funded clinics in Selkirk uh, and as well at Bethesda Hospital in Steinbeck. And in my training, I was in Norway House and RV at Costa Rica and rural Ecuador. So I've had the, the benefit of seeing a wide range of different uh, primary care environments and the challenges that family physicians face day-to-day caring for their patients. It's honestly one of the most difficult specialties and we need to be supporting our family doctors because primary care is the foundation of our health system. None of the rest of our system can function without that base in place and providing care to patients and what we're seeing is a crisis in primary care. We know that we're on the precipice of a crisis in physicians overall. We know that a third of all physicians in Manitoba are talking about reducing their hours or retiring in the next few years, but we're already there when it comes to primary care. And that's because of the excessive workload, the lower remuneration, the difficult paperwork that is assigned to all of the work in these clinics. I spent time recently at Access River East and some rural clinics chatting with the docs there and hearing about how much of an administrative burden they face every day. So I want to advocate for bold changes, changes to how our clinics are organized, to the teams that we work with, and bold changes to how we remunerate our doctors. I'm interested to see the final product for what's happening in BC and see if there's things we can learn to apply to other provinces about going beyond the fee-for-service model to look at other ways to pay for the work that encourages quality care and not just quantity. But above all, we need it to be fair and flexible and reflective of the work and expertise of family physicians. And so I look forward to being able to advocate on behalf of my family uh, and all of you that I've worked with. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Dr. Francois, in your role as an elected leader of the CMA, what changes would you advocate for to ensure that family doctors are adequately resourced and respected for their work? Well, they, they say you never realize the value of something till it's gone. Um, and unfortunately, many Canadians have lost their family physicians. They've retired, they've moved away. Uh, we're now one in five Canadians without a family physicians. That's 150,000 here in Manitoba. Um, and dealing with that shortage is really going to be quite important for us to rebuild our, our, our community of family physicians. Uh, but alone, it won't be enough. Uh, and I think there's a need to, to move quickly to more team-based approaches. Uh, Jane Philpott, uh, Dean at Queens and uh, former health minister uh, in her recent uh, a report on uh, from the public health uh, public policy forum uh, called that uh, all Canadians should be able to access a, a family health team within 30 minutes of where they live or their work. Uh, and I think that's a laudable goal. And I think that's one we should push to achieve. And what can the CMA do? And what could I do in the role as president of the CMA? Um, well, I think some of that work is already starting uh, with the uh, federal uh, provincial agreements around uh, new funding uh, tied in with that is an expansion of uh, family health services. Um, I think we need to make sure that we have good data to uh, be able to measure our progress. We need we need lots of innovation in this area. We need experiments. Uh, we need to be able to compare those experiments and how well they work uh, to be able to identify the best practices. The CMA along with other organizations such as the College of Family Physicians of Canada are in good positions to be brokers of, uh, of some of those discussions. Um, I think there's uh, also need to look at remuneration models. Uh, the BC experiment is one of those things that um, is, is quite interested in, in, in that it identifies the need to remunerate some volume, but recognizes that there is some basic work that occurs that needs to be remunerated, especially when you're moving into a team-based environment uh, where some of your interactions are about supporting others in your team. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Francois. Dr. Bailey, uh, as an elected um, official with the CMA, uh, what would you do to ensure that uh, family physicians are adequately uh, resourced and respected for their work? Thanks, Dr. Lynch and Dr. Collins. 
the role of family physician in our healthcare system is, is probably the most challenging, especially in medicine. Family physicians are the entry to the healthcare system for most Canadians. And yet we now find ourselves in a situation in which over 5 million Canadians are without a family physician. For decades, we've operated without a national human resource strategy. We have no definite numbers for how many physicians we have in each specialty and how they practice. Medical school enrollment and residency positions have been determined on an ad hoc basis. This needs to change. We need national data to help us make decisions and guide the future so that we have the numbers of physicians that we need. We need to help family physicians by providing them the resources that they need to provide better care. Team-based care with easy access to other allied health professionals will allow family physicians to work to the peak of their abilities. So many family physicians tell me the challenges that they face dealing with mental illness in their patients and the lack of resources to help them manage this. We need to make it easier for family physicians to obtain specialty consultation when required, creative solutions like expanded rapid e-consultation and enhanced virtual care should be embraced. Medical care needs to be made more efficient. I applaud the recent efforts at highlighting physicians soul sucking administrative burden as was so eloquently described by Dr. Bradshaw, our Doctors Manitoba president. Finally, as mentioned by my colleagues, we need to ensure that family physicians receive fair compensation for their work, rewarding not only quantity, but also quality of care. BC's proposed significant changes to their model, and I know that CMA and the other PTMAs are examining this closely. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Batad. In your role as an elected leader of the CMA, what changes would you advocate for to ensure that family doctors are adequately resourced and respected for their work? Thank you, Dr. Collins, and good evening, Dr. Lynch. As a specialty, in my opinion, family medicine has a public relations problem that is entrenched in medical culture. Learners, I've written a bunch of CARMS letters. Learners see it as a backup specialty during their CARMS. Subspecialists within our institutions criticize family medicine unfairly often with the benefit of hindsight and observation of natural clinical progression. This happens a lot in our teaching institutions, continues to happen. The term GP has a negative connotation. It does not recognize that family medicine is a distinct specialty, not much different from what I do as a general, internal medicine, general internist. Fixing the image problem must occur in the public sphere and in our teaching institutions. And it is a tough ask, but it is one that we must start with. We must acknowledge uh, that a lot of this advocacy work already has been done by Dr. Jose Francois. And, and, and more recently, his team has uh, increased the amount of family medicine residency spots. And so this is, this is a great start for, for the specialty of family medicine. We must increase our numbers. And as my colleagues have mentioned, remove a lot of the administrative burdens and let family doctors be family doctors and do the things that they do uh, the best. Resources must also go beyond remuneration and, and, and my three colleagues have talked about remuneration and that's, that's an interesting and a big topic in and of itself, but it must go beyond that. In Manitoba we, and other uh, um, regions of the country, there are uh, barriers for uh, physicians not practicing in an urban environment, and that must be addressed also. We must address the difficulty of practice in these in these areas, and there must be initiatives to support uh, family physicians and their families, especially on early early on in their uh, in their training. And so, with that, um, I think that family medicine and we as their as subspecialists and specialists have a lot of work to do in helping our family medicine colleagues um, get the recognition that they deserve. Thank you, Dr. Patad, and thank you all for, for your insightful answers. Thank you, Dr. Lynch, for joining us this evening and representing the Manitoba College of Family Physicians and indeed for your leadership uh, at this time. We're going to go to the questions um, from the audience now. So if you have a question for the candidates, please submit it using the Q&A button. I will now ask our staff moderator for the most upvoted question.
So this will be, uh, for those of you keeping count, this will be question number four, and it's from Dr. Marsha Anderson. How would you lead the CMA in working with the Black Physicians Association of Canada and the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada in addressing the ongoing impacts of racism and colonialization on health outcomes, healthcare quality, and the health workforce? And I'll just remind you that, um, again, as with all the other questions, you have two minutes to answer. And for this particular question, we'll start, please, with Dr. Reimer. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, so much for that question. Um, we've talked a lot about the importance of diversity uh, in the health workforce and caring for patients uh, of diverse backgrounds as well. And it is critical that we have those diverse leadership uh, voices at the table. So working with the Black Physicians of Canada, working with the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada is critical to make sure that we are moving things in the right direction. What I learned during the pandemic, in particular working on the vaccine task force, was how important it is to ensure that uh, Indigenous people, that Black people, that people of colour are given seats at the table, are given voices and are resourced to be able to put in place the policies, the programs, the interventions that we need in order to improve health outcomes. We saw a tremendous success when we shifted some of those resources, uh, the decision-making power, the dollars to our Indigenous colleagues uh, with the ability to reach out to the communities directly. And we see the benefit in multiple ways. We see the way that people feel reflected when they see people who look like them in leadership. And we see that with patients and we see that with people who are earlier in their career, that it inspires early career individuals to reach further and work harder when they see the people who look like them uh, and that they can aspire towards. But also with patients where they can feel safe where they know that individuals have experienced similar things that they've experienced, who can point out uh, when there's issues of racism and help guide the institutions to shift their policies to prevent structural racism and help all of us to recognize how we need to do better. And so I look forward to the opportunity to work alongside the voices of these institutions to make sure that those voices are heard. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Dr. Batad. How would you lead the CMA in working with the Black Physicians Association of Canada and the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada in addressing the ongoing impacts of racism and colonialism on health outcomes, healthcare quality, and the health workforce? Thank you, Dr. Collins, and thank you, Dr. Anderson, for the question. We know uh, from the evidence that the health outcomes for Indigenous and Black uh, and other people of colour as well as the LGBTQ2S community um, are much poorer than people who don't have multiracial identities or uh, gendered identities. And I think that working with um, these two associations should include a, a honest and open dialogue because both communities will have their different needs. Some they will share um, um, as a commonality, but some will also have different needs. I have worked a lot with um, BIPOC communities, both during the pandemic um, on vaccine hesitancy. And more recently, prior to the pandemic, I was working with um, a mentorship, forming a mentorship group for uh, BIPOC um, undergraduate students and high school students that wouldn't otherwise see medicine as a viable career because of racial and socioeconomic um, barriers. I think that we must start there um, in order to create a workforce um, that my colleagues have mentioned as something that can represent the population that, that, um, that we are uh, privileged enough uh, to take care of. Um, but working with um, different associations um, and learning from them what it is that is the most important issue 
um, and using the CMA's very strong advocacy voice to amplify uh, those concerns uh, would be um, a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Badhad. Dr. Bailey, how would you lead the CMA in working with the Black Physicians Association of Canada and the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada in addressing the ongoing impacts of racism and colonialism on health outcomes, health care quality, and the health workforce? Thank you, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Collins. I know that both myself and the CMA are committed to reconciliation with our First Nations, Inuit, and Métis populations. Health is an important part of reconciliation, and, and we know that several of the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission deal with the health of our Indigenous populations. Likewise, we know that our Black and other people of colour are, are marginalised in our healthcare system and also in society as a whole. There's clearly uh, worse health outcomes in so many indicators, life expectancy, infant mortality, suicide and mental health, trauma for Indigenous Canadians and other marginalized communities. CMA and all Canadians need to do the hard work required to help close these gaps. The CMA mission recognizes that we need to work in allyship with these communities and with their leadership groups, like the Black Physicians Association of Canada and the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada, to try and achieve the goal of improving health outcomes for these populations. And I fully agree. Addressing society inequality, improving educational opportunities, increasing the number of healthcare providers, and even more so, uh, First Nation uh, healthcare providers in Aboriginal communities, and increased cultural competency training in medicine are all tools that are, at, that are at our disposal to try and address the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Francois, how would you lead the CMA in working with the Black Physicians Association of Canada and the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada in addressing the ongoing impacts of racism and colonialism on health outcomes, health care quality, and the health workforce? I think the CMA um, should use its reputation, leverage uh, its its relationships with other organizations to really build the coalitions that will bring a lot of change. And I think that change needs to happen at different levels. Uh, certainly within our educational programs, uh, we need to work with associations of faculty of medicine, the College of Family Physicians, the Royal College to make sure the people that we do train uh, have the skills, the cultural safety competencies that they need to uh, provide care to a variety of patients. Um, we need to make sure the teachers also have uh, that same language. Uh, so practicing physicians, uh, so working with regulatory authorities to make sure that everyone has um, you know, basic knowledge of uh, issues around Indigenous health and, and history. Um, the other piece is the design of health services. Uh, I think we need to be able to uh, engage uh, patients from a variety of backgrounds into the design of services. Uh, so I think COVID was a great example uh, in public health, uh, engaging different communities uh, on how they could improve um, ad adoption of vaccination. Uh, there was great work done on that at the local level. Uh, and the success really depended on that feedback from, from individuals, uh, communities, uh, and how they want service delivered. And you could take that to all sorts of types of communities um, and different backgrounds. Uh, so I think these are the places where the CMA can use its voice. Thank you, Dr. Francois. Thank you all. I'll now ask please the staff moderator to upload question number five from uh, our audience this evening. Thank you. Question five is from Josh Aquin. The CMA president regularly communicates with physicians, medical learners, political decision makers, and the public. 
Please comment on your skills or experience with communicating with these diverse groups of people and how you will use your communication skills to best represent physicians. And to start us off with this question, uh, I'll go to Dr. Batad, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Collins. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, I have a fairly diverse uh, leadership of experience. I have led um, from the front um, of uh, multi, uh, multiple operations across the world. I've engaged in different populations, speaking different language and different cultures. And I have learned um, certain communication skills that would ser serve me in very good stead uh, with this. As mentioned in the questions, medical learners, political decision makers, the public and physicians could have very, very divergent and competing interests that can be influenced by ideology or political leanings. Dr. Alika Lafontaine has clearly stated that let's get politics, politics out of the way and get to fixing the healthcare uh, system. I do think that over 20 years in the military, dealing with multiple different um, uh, entities with competing interests that have cultural um, uh, and political um, flavors to it um, makes me keenly aware uh, of unique um, communication styles that must be used not to um, uh, offend one or the other and to bring uh, people uh, together to a common goal. The question is, um, the question is excellent because it really does reflect what the president elect of the CMA and the president of the CMA is tasked to do, and that is to bring together a broad range of beliefs and um, uh, and priorities uh, from from such a, a diverse uh, a country. And I feel that I have that leadership experience. Thank you, Dr. Batad. Dr. Reimer, please comment on your skills and experience with communicating with diverse groups of people and how you will use your communication skills to best represent physicians. Thank you so much, Dr. Aquin, for that question. Um, I've had the, the great privilege of training in public health where a, a large portion of the training that I received was on the topic of communication, communicating with patients, communicating with communities, and communicating with decision makers, uh, politicians and uh, bureaucrats and other decision makers within the system. And I've had the privilege as well of using this uh, training to gain experience in media, in speaking with politicians, in speaking with physicians in many settings. In particular, in the last few years throughout the pandemic, my job was to meet every day with politicians and meet every day with decision makers and speak every day to the public, whether it was through the general media, through social media, through meetings, uh, through presentations. That was the job that I was tasked with doing. And so you've seen me navigate challenging political situations and challenging public communication environments where sometimes the information that we had was very limited and we had to make difficult decisions and communicate those difficult, complex decisions to physicians, to the public and to decision makers in a way that made sense. And so I feel confident that I can take these skills, the training I received, the experience I've had these last few years, and take it to the national level to advocate for you using the complicated nature of the challenges that you face every day and making that understandable to the decision makers, to the public, and to all of us as physicians so that we can be on the same team as we try to move towards positive changes in our system. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Dr. Francois, please comment on your skills or experience with communicating with diverse groups of people and how you will use your communication skills to best represent physicians. Uh, thank you, Josh, for that question. Uh, I, I think it starts by understanding who your audience is. When communicating, you need to figure out, are you talking to a general public? Are you talking to decision makers? Are you talking uh, to uh, physicians uh, in your community. 
Um, and then from that understanding of who your audience is thinking about what is the message you want to convey. Um, and then thinking about how you convey it or, or who is conveying it. Uh, sometimes um, you may think the one person is the best person to deliver a message rather than the leader. So I, I think uh, that that is an important piece of, of crafting messages and communication. Um, I have done a fair amount of that communication to various audiences, uh, whether that is government, writing briefing notes, meeting with ministers, um, whether that is uh, talking with uh, faculty members in our department, conveying things like strategy, vision, uh, and again, convening to the general public. So thinking about uh, messaging around a variety of issues, uh, especially during the pandemic and helping others convey the message as well. Because when we assist others or people that are working with us to also deliver a message, we can amplify the messages we provide. The, the other piece of, of the communication is, is consensus building. I think um, as, uh, as a physician leader, uh, I've chaired a number of national groups, uh, department chairs, uh, associate dean groups, um, and the skills needed to do that work are slightly different than public communication. Uh, again, you need to be able to facilitate conversation and dialogue uh, and surface any conflicts. Uh, so those are things that I've done uh, quite often at the national level. Thank you, Dr. Francois and Dr. Bailey. Please comment on your skills or experience with communication, communicating with diverse groups of people and how you will use your communication skills to best represent physicians. Thanks, Dr. Aquin and, and Dr. Collins. Well, as I uh, mentioned in my introduction, I have spent my uh, entire career in medical leadership of, in one form or another. Uh, I spent many years as a director and, and ultimately as president of my National Specialty Society, the Canadian Rheumatology Association. Uh, I have been a board director, board chair, and president of uh, Doctors Manitoba, uh, helping lead our organization and, and Manitoba's physicians uh, through the pandemic. Uh, likewise, uh, I've been very active in uh, medical education uh, through my career, uh, working with the uh, medical learners and with uh, administration and the university. So in, in all of these positions, uh, communication has been a major part of the role. Uh, during the pandemic with Doctors Manitoba, uh, I was engaged in uh, frequent discussions uh, with the public. Uh, we discussed uh, frequently uh, with the media the ongoing needs uh, of Manitobans and of Manitoban physicians. Uh, I sat across the table from the Deputy Minister and the Minister of Health uh, advocating for physicians' needs uh, during the pandemic. In all of these roles, uh, I've had uh, the opportunity to communicate with uh, diverse groups of the population. I've had the opportunity to do uh, media training to help improve my skills. And I'm confident that I would be able to meet the needs of Canadian physicians if I was elected as CMA president-elect. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, and thank you all. I'll now ask the staff moderator to upload uh, question number six, and this will be our last question for this evening. Thank you, question number six is from Ye Young, and I apologize if I have uh, not said your name correctly. What is your opinion about women in medical leadership and how do you intend to address this as president? And we'll begin please with Dr. Bailey. Thank you for the question. I'm going to broaden the discussion somewhat beyond just women in medical leadership to the issue of uh, equity and inclusiveness in, uh, in all forms of medical leadership. You know, I want to applaud the efforts of the CMA to be a leader in EDI issues. Uh, the CMA has taken an intentional approach uh, to address this important issue. You know, EDI and equity issues have been entrenched as part of the strategic plan, and I know that the CMA has invested significant resources uh, to addressing this issue. You know, one need only look uh, to the CMA presence in recent and upcoming years. We've had female presence. 
we've had male presidents. We now have an Aboriginal president. We've had a president who's been of color. We've had family physicians. We've had specialists. We've had Anglophone. We've had Francophone. You know, both physicians and the CMA uh, want to see a general medical system that looks like the community. You know, I know that the CMA can be a force to encourage uh, EDI in medical culture. Uh, I know that the CMA has been committed to EDI issues, and that's important for the CMA as an organization because if the uh, diversity of opinions are reflected at the board table, it helps avoid groupthink and ensure that the best decision possible for the organization is made. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Francois, what is your opinion about women in medical leadership and how do you intend to address this as president? Um, so using that EDI lens, I, I, I agree that diversity of, of, of perspectives is very useful um, in, in organizations. So whether that's uh, at the executive group, whether that's at your board table. Um, and uh, so care needs to be taken in terms of ensuring that you're creating the environment where um, women or people of color or indigenous or from LGBTQ backgrounds feel comfortable in roles, feel that they can be successful in roles. Um, so there is uh, definitely the tone needs to be set by, by leadership, uh, that um, that environment is welcoming. Um, that there is a pathway for progression and career, um, and that um, you're open and thoughtful about the barriers that might exist in in your organization um, that uh, that might exist and that you need to address. So uh, that can be everything from um, you know someone working part time because of family issues. Uh, that can be based on background and and not having had a number of experiences that would necessarily lend them to be a natural choice in, in, in a selection process. So care needs to be um, brought into that EDI lens um, in a variety of levels. Um, so I, I think um, my role in CMA would be to use the experience I've gained over the years at the University of Manitoba, where we've had a very strong commitment to EDI uh, and apply those same learnings to uh, my work in the CMA. Thank you, Dr. Francois. Dr. Reimer, what is your opinion about me women in medical leadership and how do you intend to address this as president? Thank you so much for the question, Ye Young. Um, you know, obviously as a woman, I'm, I'm very passionate about this issue. You know, when I look at uh, CMA presidents, there have been 11 female presidents in the 170 year history of the organization. And so certainly something where we need to be paying attention and, and being purposeful about encouraging women, not necessarily uh, in this role alone, but in medical leadership more generally. When we look at the pathway for women, we see that we now have in most medical classes, at least 50% of the class are women. But as we progress through leadership, those numbers drop off quite quickly. Uh, when we look at our deans of medicine, for example, including in Manitoba, we have 23% of deans of medicine in Canada are women. Uh, despite the fact that we make up 45% of all physicians in the country. And so this is something that uh, we need to have purposeful action on. We need to look at what it is that's discouraging women from pursuing the leadership positions and make sure that we have, uh, we have people that they can aspire towards, but also that we've removed the barriers that uh, contribute to women not pursuing these positions. You know, I look at my own role as CMO and I'm the only female CMO in the province. And so it's something that I care a lot about. And when we talk about broader EDI as a queer person, I care a lot about that as well. And I think it's really critical to have uh, the aspect of LGBTQ, of uh, racialized populations also kept at the forefront. 
But specifically when we're talking about women, this is something that uh, is we have good measures on, that we've looked at things like conference speakers and the fact that women are greatly underrepresented as conference speakers. And I want to be a, an inspiration in a way that I had those female uh, inspirations before me when I look at you know Catherine Smart and the amazing work that she's done recently. So I, I hope to, to have people vote for me so that I can continue on that work of promoting women in medical leadership. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. Dr. Batad, what is your opinion about women in medical leadership and how do you intend to address this as president? Thank you, Dr. Collins, and thank you, Yu Young, for that question. Um, as Dr. Reimer mentioned, um, there was the rise of um, numbers of women in uh, medicine um, has occurred, but the numbers do drop off. And there was an article in the CMAJ in 2018 that looked at that. And they said, you know, th there was a rise of women entering medical school, but this is not matched by leadership. And this is, of course, not an ideal situation. Um, women uh, in medicine still have quite a few barriers um, that they face. And in my own section alone, we identified this over five years ago as an issue in that we did not have any women um, in senior leadership. Now there have been um, progress towards that. Um, and there more recently, this article is now five years old, but more recently there has been more women um, involved in leadership uh, and, and have come forward. The pandemic has shown us excellent uh, medical leaders, including Dr. Josh Reimer here in Manitoba. And that is encouraging because then medical learners that are women can, can aspire to that. We have um, Dr. Marcia Anderson and Dr. Gigi Osler, who have also done excellent work in, in advancing leadership um, uh, for women and the BIPOC community. Um, Broadening the discussion, as Dr. Bailey did, um, although women are now starting to approach higher levels in leadership, that number is even more dismal for the BIPOC community. So I think there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done here. Um, and we can't just say, pay lip service to it and say, oh, you know, we need more women in EDI uh, from, a, from an EDI point of view. Uh, we must do like what they did in Alberta a few years ago and say, by X amount of years, there will be this many women in leadership in our sections, in our universities, in our institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patad. So we're coming close to the end of the session. I would like now to invite uh, each of the candidates to share with us uh, some parting words and, and maybe in particular their outlook for the future in in uh, one minute or less, please. And we'll start with Dr. Francois. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Um, I, when I look forward, I, I think there's, there's a, a lot of work to be done to repair some of the damage to our system. Um, there's uh, resources that are coming uh, with some of those new dollars from federal uh, provincial agreements. Uh, there's there's lots of creativity within our ranks uh, and lots of energies to improve things. Uh, so I think the outlook is positive. We just need to put our shoulder to the wheel uh, and um, move to new and innovative uh, ways of doing our work. Uh, I hope that I can use uh, the experience uh, in my leadership roles in Manitoba uh, to help guide some of that national conversation. Thanks very much, Dr. Francois. Next, Dr. Bailey, your, your thoughts for the future. Thanks, Dr. Collins. You know, I truly believe that there's never been a more important time uh, for the CMA than now. The national spotlight is on physicians and on our healthcare system. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Collins uh, Dr. Borditsky and Dr. Lynch and the CMA staff for their time organizing this event. Uh, I'd like to thank my fellow candidates for uh, stepping forward and uh, taking this step and uh, their efforts to, uh, to become president-elect of the CMA. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone who attended tonight uh, for taking the time to engage with the candidates and with the CMA. Uh, I hope that I was able to convince voters that uh, my skill set 
of uh, national uh, level leadership governance and advocacy experience would make me a worthwhile uh, candidate for the position. Uh, so please, uh, everyone, do your part and vote uh, beginning on February 22nd. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Dr. Batad, your parting words, please. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Um, there is a crisis, there is no doubt. Um, throughout my career, I've met lots of crises. When, when you step on the ground and you think something is absolutely impossible and there is no way that you can fix it, but we always fixed it. We like if there is the will and um, uh, the willingness to work hard to fixing issues and and learning creative uh, ways to do it. Uh, we can do it. There is a crisis in the system that's been building. It's been laid bare by the pandemic, but with crisis always comes opportunity. And if we do our jobs well as physicians, we can advocate for a better healthcare system, a more resilient healthcare system, a more representative healthcare system, and really set the stage for a bright future uh, for physicians um, and future physicians uh, in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Batet. Dr. Reimer, parting words. Thank you so much. Um, I am an optimist by nature, and, and I truly believe that there has never been a more important time to advocate for bold changes than right now. Politicians are listening. The public is listening. As president, as president-elect, I will take my experiences in primary care, in acute care, in public health, my experiences in rural life, in urban medicine, and I'll use my expertise from years of political advocacy and public communication to advocate for you, for physicians. We can create a better system, one that supports you the, to do what you do best, and that's caring for Canadians. So I really thank you for joining today and hope that you all vote. Merci pour votre temps et vos questions, and I, Really, I'm just thankful to everyone uh, who joined us today. Thank you, Dr. Reimer. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the candidates for sharing their passion and commitment to the health workforce, the health system, and the health of the population. And indeed, these four candidates have shown great commitment to, to the CMA. It's not an easy task to do what they're doing, running a campaign, um, and it, it comes at, uh, um, it, it takes sacrifice to do that. So, so in my personal and on behalf of the CMA, our thanks for, for doing that. I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of you for, for joining us uh, this evening, for submitting your questions. Um, it's been wonderful to see the participation that we, uh, that we had here this evening. Um, so what's next? Well, the election period opens for members with the Manitoba Postal Code on February 22nd and closes March 8th. All eligible CMA members will receive an email with instructions on February 22nd. Remember, if you wish to vote, please renew your CMA membership by February 16th. We will declare the results of the election on cma.ca. The elected candidate will be put forward for ratification by CMA General Counsel at the annual general meeting on August 16th. As a special note, we are accepting applications until March 16th for Manitoba and Alberta director positions on the CMA Board of Directors as well as several committee positions. For details, please visit cma.ca slash cma nominations.